Thank you, Dave. Wow, packed balcony. Good to see everybody. If you came in late, good morning. Today's a very, very special day for me and my whole family, extended family, because my son Logan is going to be getting baptized today, so I expect to see you all there. As they said earlier, it's right on the beach there. It's a great opportunity to do it out there in the ocean. But it's not just a special day for our family. I know it's a special day for a lot of you here at this church who've come to love and admire Logan. During the off-season, there's not as many people here, so a lot of you have gotten very intimate with my son and my daughter, and I know you've told me you've come to really admire him. And so it probably won't surprise you to know that you're not the only ones that have come to admire him. Um, We've heard recently that there's some people in the community that have also come to admire Logan. Uh, You may not know this, but he volunteers his time over there at the Beach Haven Library, which is just catty corner here. It's a cute little library if you've never been in there. He, um, he helps the ladies there carry books down into the basement. Uh, he helps to straighten up the uh, children's section when it gets disorganized. And little odds and ends jobs that they have for him. But that's not all. He also uh, has been helping a couple in Ship Bottom. They have little odds and ends things for him to do too, like... He raked their driveway to make sure the stones were, you know, evenly distributed. And then he did a little painting for them. I was wondering how that turned out. Um, He did some painting. He did a little gardening for them. And they, too, have come to really admire Logan. And they've told Ashley and I, what a great little boy you have there. And so here's why I'm telling you all this. I told it to the 8 a.m. service, too. And I did it for two reasons. One, because I wanted to embarrass my son, which is my right as his father. And he was sitting back there. But the other reason is this, the more important reason. Logan, whenever he gets around other people, he loves to talk about the thing that's most important to him. And for a 10, 11-year-old, you'd probably think, well, that's baseball, surfing, and superheroes. But that's not the truth. Whenever Logan gets around people, he talks about Jesus. We haven't told him to do this. He does it on his own. And so here's what happens. Every time Logan talks to somebody new about Jesus, he always comes home and he has questions because he's a very smart little guy. And so Ashley will send him over to my office and he'll come knocking and he'll say, can I sit and talk with you? And here's usually what his questions are about. Logan is very interested right now in other worldviews. You know the word worldview, the lens through which you see the world unfolding around you. So he comes in and he talks to me about questions that maybe someone brought up that he doesn't know the answer to. And Logan has already come to learn that his dad doesn't have all the answers, but he comes to me because he knows I'm just going to take him to the Bible. I'm going to point him to what Jesus had to say about whatever topic Logan wants to know. And so he's come to trust. If I have a question, I'll go to dad because I know dad will take me to the Bible. He just wants to know what Jesus has to say about a subject. Don't you feel the same? Regardless of what you may think about who Jesus was, you can't deny his presence on planet earth changed the world forever. Time Magazine even said, most influential person in the history of humankind was Jesus of Nazareth. Any secular scholar will tell you, there's no denying. Anybody who's worth their salt will tell you, the man really did live in Nazareth, Nazareth, and he died on a Roman cross. So anybody who knows anything will tell you there was a historical Jesus. But not everybody believes what the Bible says about him. So Logan comes and he wants to know, what are the different, specifically, what are the different religions of the world What are they for? What are they all about? And this just happens to be my favorite subject in the world. So I love to talk about this with Logan. And then he runs on back and tells people what he's learned. Well, the reason that I'm bringing this all up today is because we're doing this new series, Life According to Jesus. And Life According to Jesus is all about the different aspects of what it means to be human. Let's face it, being human is very complicated. As soon as you think you've got it all figured out, You get thrown a curveball, and there's something else there that you just don't understand. Well, according to the book of Acts, Jesus was the author of life. So life has a perfecter, and Jesus is it. And so, because Logan has been asking me, Dad, could you please preach a sermon on religion according to Jesus? Like, what did Jesus have to say about religion? Well, you'll be, maybe you won't be surprised. I thought you might be. He said a lot. A whole lot about the subject of religion. And so, for my son today, I thought, he's being baptized today. I'm going to preach that sermon for him today. So today's message is called Religion According to Jesus. And before we do anything else, we should probably ask God for his help. 
Don't you agree? Let's pray. Father, no one has come here to hear anything from me, especially my family who knows me well. They don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from Jesus. And so I pray that you would keep me from saying anything that's not true. If I'm going to say anything other than what your word teaches, I pray that you would keep me from talking. Because the only thing that matters is the truth. And I pray that we would get to the bottom of it today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, For those of you who come here regularly, you'll know that I am a huge believer in defining our terms because if you're married, you'll probably realize that a lot of misunderstandings come when you just, you think you're talking about the same thing, but you're actually not. You say one thing, someone else hears something else than you meant it to mean, right? So we've got to define our terms right at the very beginning or else everybody's going to misunderstand everything I say. So already when I say the word religion, here's what has already happened because the way your brain has been hardwired, every single person, as soon as you hear a term, you flash through a series of slideshows or terms or memories of yours that you associate with whatever the term is, right? So I say religion. And all of a sudden, you have a picture pop into your head of what you believe that to be. Now, I would bet that if I passed around this microphone and said, what is religion? We'd have a million different answers. So here's how you define anything. You go all the way back to whatever the first absolute thing was, and you start from there, and then you define your terms from that. The first absolute is God. Before there was ever matter created in the universe, God existed. So if we're going to understand whatever anything is, we have to first start with God. That only makes sense, right? I'm going to tell you something that will probably be a little controversial to some of you in here. Here it is. Every human being was born with knowledge that God exists, whether they acknowledge it or suppress it. Now, that's so important that I put it up on the screen for you so that you can, you can hold me accountable to this, okay? Every human being was born with knowledge. Those are the two words I want you to focus on for just a moment, okay? With knowledge that God exists. Here's how I can make that claim, which I know is a radical claim, especially in our culture today, which says there's no such thing as absolute truth. Here's what I want you to consider. There's not a person in this room who would deny that you have a conscience, right? I've been engaged in many debates with atheists and agnostics over the last 10, 15 years. I've listened to many scholarly debates in our universities between theists and atheists. And whenever the subject of conscience is brought up, almost without exception, whoever's on the atheist side debating starts getting loud and angry. Do you know why? Because even the world's foremost atheists will admit the conscience is a problem for their worldview. What in the world is this thing inside that every human being is born with, which sounds an alarm from the time you're a little tiny baby and your mom says, did you clean your room? And you say, "Uh uh-huh, knowing that you really just shoved it under the bed. And then what do you do? You run off and hide. Why? Because there's suddenly these alarm bells inside that are going, eh, eh, something's wrong. I just violated something in my conscience. Where does that come from? Well, the atheist worldview has no answer for it. And so here's why I bring this up. The word conscience, take a look. Made up of two root words, con, which means with, and science, which means knowledge. The word conscience means with knowledge. We've been using that word for century after century after century to describe the fact, the obvious fact, that every human being was born with knowledge of something. What? What do we have this innate knowledge of? Well... Conscience tells us that there's this moral code, this law that's been written on our hearts so that if you're a tribal person all the way on the other side of the ocean in Africa or you live here in Beach Haven, you know that, let's take lying. You know lying is wrong. And so you run away and you hide when you do it. We all have this. Where did that come from? The conscience. It doesn't matter what your worldview is, your socioeconomic status or your culture. Every one of us intuitively knows Something's wrong inside when I do something that violates this moral code. And so, whoever it was that wrote that onto our hearts, we know intuitively, I have to be held accountable for this. That's why even the little tiny ones, your little babies, they run and hide because they know, "Uh uh-oh, if I get caught, I'm in trouble, right? Well, that's where religion comes into the equation. I had to set that stage for you because... That's where the beginning of all religions have come from. Now, I'm going to make another very controversial statement. Are you ready? 
All religions are exactly the same. Bar none. Bar none. Now you're thinking, are you sure none? They're all the same? Yep, all the same. They all aim to accomplish the very same thing. Here's what it is. All religious systems of the world aim to fix what the whole planet intuitively knows is wrong with the world. And in case you're saying, well, what's that? What's wrong with the world? Everybody here knows there's something wrong with the world. If you don't, you have a homework assignment. Go home and turn on the news. (laughs) You'll know there's something wrong here. Well, you want to know what's wrong with the world? I have a little test that will show you. You ready? Go home, find your bathroom sink, look down in the sink, and then look up. Some are getting it, some are not. That's what's wrong with the world. Now, here's where some of you may disagree. I'm telling you that what's wrong with the world is the human heart. Just examine this for a minute. Why is there hunger in the world? Because you won't share your food. Why is there a growing rate of um, sex trafficking here in the United States? Go home and look at the statistics. This will make you sick to your stomach, including religious people who take advantage of little boys and little girls. Sick to your stomach. Why is this happening? Why, now, in case you say, well, I've never done any of that. Why is there fighting in your household? Got you all. There is in mine too. Why is that? It's because something is wrong with our hearts. And you've known it since you were born. It's the self-centered human heart that is to blame for everything that is wrong with the world. And so religion aims to offer a remedy for what's wrong with the world. Religion is man's attempt to put together a system. Pick a religion. Pick one in your head. Religion is man's attempt to put together a system of certain rituals, certain little sacrifices, certain little ceremonies. And when you put all that together, here's what you're doing. You're saying, if I do this and then do this and then pray this and then do this and go see that guy and confess my sins to this guy, make this kind of financial sacrifice, then when I stand before God, I'll be good. And I'll be able to silence those alarm bells that keep going off in my head. That's what religion aims to do. It aims to offer a solution to the human conscience. There's a word for this experience that everybody knows. It's the word justification. You know what that is? That's a legal term. Justification. Every human being intuitively knows there's something wrong with me. Why do I do the things I do? You ever been driving home? Why did I say that? I'm such a buffoon. Why did I talk to my wife that way? I know it's only going to make things hard when I get home. Every one of us. So we know there's a problem inside of here. And we know, ultimately, I have to be accountable for everything I've done. What am I going to say when my time comes and I actually have to stand before God? Religion aims to offer an answer to that. We all love the idea of justice, right? Here's how I know that for sure. Because whenever a superhero movie comes out, it's like number one at the box office. Because we love to see when evil gets its day, right? When the bad guy gets his that's coming to him. What we don't love is when justice comes looking for us. You see, here's what most people do. They look at the evening news and they say, that's the bad guy, but the guy sitting on the couch, that's the good guy. And here's the problem. Everyone does that. Everyone, because we measure ourselves against our neighbor. Well... Not as good as that guy, but I'm certainly better than him. So if I die when he dies, I'm in trouble. But if I die next to him, I'm set because I'm better than him. Who ever told you that God's going to measure you against the person sitting next to you? That's not how this works. And so we're beginning to understand why people would embrace a religious system, right? The main reason that anybody would pray to Mecca a certain number of times or why anybody would pray a rosary if they've done, say this a number of times and you'll be okay. Or why anybody would make financial um, sacrifices out of obligation. Or why somebody would go on a religious pilgrimage. Or you list out the things of whatever religion you have in your mind. There's only one reason why somebody would do that. And you really need to pay close attention to me here. To do those things, here's what you're thinking. I'm building up trust that when my day in court comes where I know I've got to answer to God, I'll have enough good works or righteousness, the Bible calls that, good works so that when I stand before God, I'll be cleared of my charges. That's what justification means, to be exonerated. 
pardoned, cleared of the charges against you. And so if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, I'm in. And religious systems aim to trap you. Now, why do I say that? Now, that's a harsh word, so you're going to have to say, hey, that's a little harsh. Tell me what you mean by that. Everyone here knows that all religious systems aim to trap you in a cycle. You know what the cycle is? Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Imagine that you're a religious leader and you're inventing your own religious system that people have to adhere to so that when they get to God, they'll be cleared. And you're walking around going, how can I get these people to buy into my religious system? I know. I'll tell them that every time they do something that violates their conscience, they got to come back to me, do the stuff, whatever it is, say this, pray this, do the stuff, and then they'll be cleared. And so here's what happens. You go in, you pray the stuff, confess this, make the financial whatever, write your check out. Then you go out and you're like, yes, I'm good now. I'm never going to do that again. And then you walk out and you're good for a couple of months. And then you didn't sleep so well, didn't eat right, and you fall short again. Like, man, now I've got to go back again and do the same thing over again. And you're like, this is the time. Now I'm going to do it. And you walk out and you're doing good for a couple of weeks. And then your wife says something or your husband says something that makes you mad. And you, you blow it again. Like, all right, back to the religious system again. And guess what? This shame and guilt cycle happens for the rest of your life. <sighs> Here's where Jesus comes into the play. When Jesus showed up on the scene, the religion of his day was Judaism. He was a Jew. And he came onto the scene and completely dismantled the entire premise of of a religious merit system as a means of earning your way to God. He dismantled it, and they hated him for it. Every time he went out in public and taught, he was confronted by these religious leaders who wanted to trap people in this cycle of guilt and shame, and guilt and shame. And they were so upset with him that after only 30-some months, three years of public ministry, they killed him because he was messing with their worldview. And so... This morning, what I want you to see is that Jesus publicly exposed all the fundamental flaws in all religious systems of the world. Systems that make people feel like they're never going to measure up and keep them trapped for their entire life. I, again, I don't want you to take my word for it, so I want to show you with your own eyes so that you can be the judge of what Jesus taught. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 18. If you don't have one, there's one right in front of you. If you don't feel like looking at that, I'm going to portray the, or display the words right up here on the screen behind me, okay? Here's what you need to know while you're turning there so you have a little context. Jesus regularly had confrontations with the religious leaders of the day. If you've ever read the Gospels, you know that takes up a whole lot of the first four books of the New Testament. Jesus is constantly being attacked by these religious people. I want you to remember as you turn there, what is a religious system designed to produce? We already said it, and it's important that you remember it right before we read, okay? A religious system is designed to produce trust in your own righteousness, your own good works, so that when you stand in God's courtroom, you can be cleared, right? We're all on the same page. That's what a religious system aims to accomplish. You're never going to believe the first words that come out of Jesus' mouth here in this passage. Take a look. Luke 18 9 through 14. This is Jesus speaking, and he's in a crowd full of people, bigger than this one. And he says this. He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Time out. That's like the textbook definition of a religious system, isn't it? Trusting that if I do this and do this and do this, then I'll be good. And so he's about to teach What's wrong with that kind of merits-based thinking? Take a look. He's going to teach them a lesson using a story, a parable. Jesus says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, a religious teacher, and the other, a tax collector. Ew. You know why you say ew? Because in that day, a tax collector was the lowest bottom rung of morality. That's the way that Jews looked at tax collectors. Like, who would ever associate with that? Well, Jesus is pairing, comparing the highest moral standard of a religious leader to the lowest moral standard, a tax collector. Look at what he has to say. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, 
I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now watch as he pulls out his resume here. He's about to pull out his resume and say, take a look, God. Look at what I do. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing back, the tax collector standing far off. He wouldn't even enter the temple. Would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast. For a Jew, to beat your breast is an outward gesture of a broken heart. A Jewish person would do this to let people know that his heart was broken on the inside. Hmm. So he's beating his breast. He beat his breast and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Listen to this. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, pardoned, exonerated. What? Key word of the whole passage, justified. Rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That last phrase there is really important. Later on, Jesus would go on to explain. He's talking about the very end. On your day, when you stand before God and have to give an account, that's what he's talking about. On that day, the person who exalts himself will be brought low. And the person who has humbled himself, like the tax collector, will be lifted up. Now, I'm going to explain that at the very, very end. All I want to do this morning is answer three questions that are probably the most important questions that any human being could ever have to answer. Three questions that every religious system says no one can know the answer to this. Every one of them. But the three questions that Jesus said, I can answer that authoritatively. And this is where Jesus and religion go like this. I offer a big idea in every message. For those of you who are visiting, a big idea, if you went to college or grad school, you'll, you'll know a thesis statement. Here's what a pastor has to do. I make a thesis statement, which we call a big idea, the point of the passage, and then I have to prove it using the Bible because that's our authority. Okay? So the big idea today, all I'm going to do is answer three questions that everybody here needs to know. The three questions are this. Who's condemned? Jesus reveals that in here, and I'll show you many other examples in the New Testament. Who will be condemned when they stand before God? Next, who's cleared? Who will be exonerated or pardoned of all the charges against them? And finally, who cares? In every church service, there's a person who's going, is he done yet? Like I got hoagies to eat and a game to watch. There's always someone. I want to address that person too who's going, get on with it, dude. You should care. And I'm going to give you the answers to these three questions right at the beginning, according to Jesus, and then I'll prove them. Fair enough? Okay. The big idea, according to Jesus. In the Creator's courtroom, the self-righteous will be condemned. The self-condemned will be cleared. And in case you're the one going, I really don't care, here's why you should. Your day in court is already on God's calendar, and it might be before I get done preaching. So that's why you need to care. Let's go through this one step at a time, shall we? Question number one, who's condemned? Well, according to Jesus, the self-righteous person. Let me explain what I mean and then I'll show you. Those who trust, I'm a good person. My good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. According to Jesus, they will come to find out one day that God measures goodness very differently than we do. Let me show you. Look at verses 11 and 12. Again, please don't take my word for any of this. I have no authority. Just listen to Jesus and be the judge yourself. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. See what he's doing? Comparing himself. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or this tax collector. Resume time. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to list out all the attributes that Jesus assigns to this kind of person. And I just want you to examine your own life and say, do I fall into the category of a self-righteous person or this tax collector? Just examine, okay? Look at the attributes that Jesus uh, ascribes to a self-righteous person, okay? First, this person is convinced, he's confident in his own innocence because of his own perception of moral goodness. 
he thinks he's the authority. So he justifies himself. I know what's good and what's bad. So he justifies himself. Second, he's determined that he's done what God requires. Well, how did he determine that? Next, he believes that his life will demonstrate that he's been good more than he's been bad. So he's got that scale system, right? Next, he lists his sacrifices as his justification to be accepted by God. God, look what I've done. And compare it to all these other people. Look what I've done. I'm the good guy. The next one is the most important one that summarizes them all. He measures himself against other people. And that is the biggest mistake that people make. This is a self-deceived person. What's the final verdict for a person like this? According to Jesus, not justified. Condemned. Now let me show you, because that's a harsh indictment. And again, I don't want you to take my word for it. Thankfully, this isn't the only place Jesus talked about this. Two chapters back, look at what he says. Luke 16. The Pharisees who were lovers of money. Time out. That doesn't just mean they love when money comes, but that means they reserve the seats at the best table for the people who drive the BMW. They love when people have showcases of money. I had a couple doctors in the first service. I know I have a couple lawyers here. They would, Pharisees would come along and say, now nah, there's a man who I'm going to spend my time with. They love those shows of money because they think that's what success is all about. Look what Jesus has to say. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, what Jesus was teaching. They ridiculed him. They laughed at him and said to him, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men, what men think is, think is such hot stuff, is an abomination in the sight of God. God sees the heart. He doesn't just look on the outward appearance of what men say is so great and worthy of praise. We stick it on the cover of a magazine. Next, the next two, are, listen to me, these next two are, they should floor you. Jesus speaking again, Matthew chapter 5. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, what? You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless my righteousness is better than the guys who sit around memorizing whole books of the Bible and who walk around showing people how good they are, unless my righteousness is better than that, I don't go to heaven? That's what he says. And in case you're still thinking, I'm still a good person. Well, then the last verse, will that'll cover it for you, okay? A few verses later, Matthew 5, 48. Look at what it says. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Unless you achieve moral perfection, you don't make the cut. Not a priest, not a nun, certainly not this pastor talking before you right now. Just ask my wife. Not a Sunday school teacher. Not an imam, which is a a, uh, Muslim religious leader. Not even, here's the big one, not even grandma. Which I know for every one of us that's hard to believe because grandma is perfect. Mine is. She's the only one. (laughs) Why would he set the bar so high? Moral perfection? Come on, Jesus. No one can achieve that. Exactly. Exactly. So you can spend all your time in that religious cycle of shame and guilt, but it's not going to ever build up to what you're hoping it will. That's the point he's trying to get to, and this is the whole point of the rest of the New Testament Now, John chapter 3 is one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible. Do you know why? Why people keep going back to John chapter 3? Because Jesus answers those three questions I posed to you. Who's condemned? Who's cleared? And who cares? He answers all three of them right in this one little chapter. I'm going to refer back to this several times, so you better make sure you know it, okay? Take a look. Don't miss this. John 3, 14 through 21. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Picture it. As Moses, he's going back to the Old Testament Judaism. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man. Take a look. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world. That's not something you hear very often in religious systems. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, here's the important parts. Listen. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. Or if you have an older version, it may say verdict. I think verdict is actually the more appropriate translation of the Greek. This is the verdict or judgment. The light has come into the world. A little later, Jesus says, I am the light that's come into the world. He's talking about himself. The light has come into the world and people have loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things, all forms of wickedness, big like Hitler style and little white lies, all in that category. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come into the light, right? Like, I'm not going to church. Who would ever want to go to church? I feel bad about myself when I go there. No one wants to come to the light. Your deeds will be exposed. Stay away. That's what he's saying. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, again, I'm going to refer back to this several times, but for this first question, who's condemned? We were just told. Whoever does not believe in what he has done, believe in him, what he's accomplished, is condemned already. So now... If there's some logical thinkers in the room, I love you. I'm so glad you're here because I am too. I love to think through things logically. And you should be saying this. Believe. Well, what does it mean to believe? So you're telling me that if I just pray, okay, Jesus, I believe in you. God's going to clear me of all my charges. No, that's not what this means. I've saved the answer for this for the climax of the sermon all the way at the end so that you have to stay awake to get to that answer? What does it mean to actually believe so that you'll be pardoned? Because that's a big statement. For now, I want to move on to point number two. But before I do, question number two. Jesus has leveled the playing field, hasn't he? He's taken, he draws a line in the sand and says, unless you are morally perfect, you don't make the cut. That means any religious system you can think of will go into the same box. Pick your system, put it into a box. Put it before Jesus when you die, and you know what he'll do? He'll stamp it, poof, metaphorically. Insufficient. That's what he'll do. He'll take your religion and stamp not enough, insufficient. That's what he's saying. Moral perfection is the standard. Question number two. Well, then who in the world could ever be cleared? If the standard is moral perfection... Everybody is doomed, right? Not according to Jesus. The self-condemned person is the one Jesus said is cleared. Here's what I mean by that. Those who acknowledge their own, listen to these next two words, moral bankruptcy. Those who acknowledge that they have no moral good works of themselves, I'm bankrupt. Those are the ones that Jesus says will be cleared on their day in court. Now, if you're logical, start to think this through, and you should already have some objections, which I'm going to answer in a minute. Look back at verses 13 through 14. Just the first part of verse 14. 14a, let's call it. It's going to deal with the tax collector now. But the tax collector, standing far off, please picture this in your mind. He doesn't even want to go near to the steps of the temple. Standing far, I'm not going in there. Far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the high religious moral guy? How can you say that? Well, let's answer a couple things first. Let's do what we did with the the Pharisee. Let's list out what Jesus says about this man, okay? The attributes of this self-condemned person who went home justified, cleared of their charges. Take a look. Number one, he's confident of his guilt because of his conscience. So the Pharisee was confident of his innocence. I'm the good guy. This one is confident of his guilt because his conscience bears witness against him. Next, he measures himself against God and knows he could never measure up. Next, he accepts the reality of his bankruptcy. He admits that he's a sinner. He labeled himself that and shows outward signs, the breastbeating, outward signs of remorse over his life. He begs for mercy. 
believes he deserves to be thrown into prison. He acknowledges his own responsibility for his actions and he expects to pay the fine for what he's done. Now, let me go back to you logical people for just a minute. I know there are a couple lawyers we have in the room. If you have any kind of legal background or legal training, you should object to this. You should say, hold on just a minute there, preacher man. If you're suggesting, let's just use a U.S. court system, okay? Imagine a U.S. judge. If he was to have a guilty criminal come down in front of him and throw himself down, like this tax collector's doing, Lord, or judge, please forgive me. I know what I did was wrong. If the judge was to say, guys, he's obviously sorry. Let's let him go. What would you say? Corrupt judge, take his bench away from him. Justice needs to be done. You would. What if he murdered your family? And you were sitting there in the courtroom. And the murderer came forward and he said, Judge, I know what I did was wrong. It was one act of just insanity. Please let me go. And the judge said, All right. You're clearly sorry. You're free to go. What would you want to do to that judge? You'd want to like get your hands around him, right? That's my family. That's my family. Justice needs to be done. Put this guy away. Well, what would you say about a God who does what Jesus is describing here? He said he was sorry, so no problem. You're dismissed. Who would ever want to worship a God that is like that? Just because you said you're sorry? Is that the requirement for justification to be cleared of your charges? No. We'd say unjust judge. Justice must be done. And here's where the gospel of Jesus Christ goes like this from religious systems. This is where everything changes according to Jesus. In the next two verses, I'm going to share with you something that really, in all truthfulness, it ought to make you want to jump out of your seat. Please don't. But it ought to make you want to do that. Because I've just told you that unless you're perfect, you don't get into heaven. And if that's news for you, it should be making your heart pound through your chest because this is the words of Jesus, not me. Listen to where the gospel of Jesus Christ separates us from all religious systems. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake. Whose sake? Say it again. That means you take this personally. Okay? For our sake... He, God, made him to be sin. doesn't mean he carried sins. It means he became sin. Yours and mine. Even the things I did yesterday and the day before and the things I will do tomorrow. He made him to be sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So wait, wait, wait. You're saying... That he became my sin, like God nailed my sin to the cross so that his perfect life can be given to my bank account? Yes, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's called, listen, imputed righteousness, substitutionary atonement. These are legal terms. Ask a lawyer. One sitting right there. I'm singling him out so that everybody will bug you at the end of the sermon. Ask a lawyer. These are legal terms. It means that God allowed for a substitute to absorb your crimes as if they were his own. He took your guilt, your bag full of guilt, on himself so that you could be released from that cycle of shame and guilt. Next, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 30. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. But God chose the foolish things of the world. If you were to interview my family, they'd probably say, that's my little brother. I'm the youngest of five. They'd say, he's the foolish one of the family. God chose the foolish things of the world, like Pastor Luke, to shame the wise. Those who think they're something, one, and they look down, they'll one day realize, I had it all backwards. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Weak things, like yucky tax collectors, will one day shame the moral high people. Weak things. 
He chose the lowly and despised things of the world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, and here's why, so that no one may boast in his presence. If you think you're going to... I'm going to finish the verse in just a second. If you think you're going to get to heaven and say, God, I've done good. Listen to me. You're a fool. if, If you think that, please tell me I'll step down and you can come up and finish because there's no way I could ever say that. Look at how it ends. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. That means I have no righteousness or holiness of my own. None. Zero. I am absolutely, totally bankrupt. That's what it takes to be a Christian. I have no goodness in me at all. Again, if you doubt me, ask my family over here. They'll tell you. I'm trusting in His holiness, His righteousness, and His perfect life. Because that's the only good act that has ever been done in the history of the world. Do you understand what this means for you personally? I hope you do. It means that he alone is the only good one that you can count on. Now more than any other question that I get from people who will call my office. Some of people have come to me crying. I get calls maybe not once a week but once a month at least from people who say, Pastor Luke, how can I know for sure that when I die I'll be justified before God? Well, if you grew up in a religious background, you can't. You can't know for sure. Because you'll always be wondering, did I do enough stuff? Did I do enough? Did I do enough? And so you'll die shaking in your boots, wondering if I did enough to please God. Let me settle this for you, not on my authority or the authority of any religious figurehead, but on the authority of Jesus. Let me tell you, you didn't do enough. Even if you had a million lifetimes like a Buddhist or a Hindu thinks, where you can come back and try to achieve nirvana, which is what? They want to be justified. They know there's something wrong. They think, if I can just get enough lifetimes, I'll finally achieve perfection, then I can be justified. You can't do it. Nobody can. Because God looks on your heart. And His standard is perfection. Nobody will make the cut. And so Jesus says, You're justified a different way. Now, what I'm about to show you is highly controversial, which I love. Are you ready for it? Many years ago, something happened that changed the world forever. It's called the Protestant Reformation. And what happened was a man named Martin Luther was sitting alone in his room, banging his head against the wall night after night because his conscience was so sensitive and he knew that according to his system of religion, he couldn't make the cut. So here's what he would do. He would go in before a priest and he would confess his sins. Sometimes, if you read his biography, for a whole day, 24 straight hours, listing them off and off and off. Then he would leave and he'd have an impure thought and so he'd turn right back around and go sit with the priest some more. He just couldn't get freedom from it. So he was literally going crazy because he knew, I can't meet this system's standards. What am I going to do? I'm condemned. And then he got hold of a Bible and actually read it for himself. Can you imagine And what he read there completely changed his life and the rest of the world. I'm going to show you a few of the verses that show without a doubt what the Bible teaches about how a man is justified, made right in the eyes of God. You be the judge. Is it your religious works being good enough or is it faith? You be the judge. Here we go. Romans 3.28. For we hold that one is justified, set right before God, By what? Apart from works of the law. All your religious works of whatever your system is, it's faith that justifies a man. Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Do you know what that means? If you have faith in God's final work of redemption, He's not angry with you. Peace with God means you don't have to be afraid of God any longer, according to the Bible, whether you believe it or not, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Most of you probably have this memorized because it's some of the most beautiful language in the Bible. For by what? Grace you have been saved. Through which vehicle? Faith. This is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of your religious good works so that no one may boast. 
This levels the playing field, doesn't it? Everyone is lumped into this same group, doesn't make the cut. Listen, church, Christian people, I hope you'll hear me, Christian people have no religion. We don't. Because religion aims to stack up our good works to make us right with God. We don't have any of that. Our religion is Christ. He alone is our only good work. We have no religion. No rules that we have to keep in order to be made right with God. We do good works because we've been made right with God. Like, what kind of life would you live if you knew that you were bankrupt and God said, I'll take care of it for you? You'd say, I'm yours. Listen, when I was in my 20s, I thought I knew God. I had led people to Jesus. I had a religious resume too. But my life, my life showed I was still boss. I wanted to do it my way. I lied to people. I was addicted to pornography. I had an alcohol addiction that you wouldn't even imagine. And here I had prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior. I said I believed, but my life showed something very, very different. I still wanted to be the boss. I was like one of these Pharisees. I would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Follow me. We'll go to the bar together. Talk it out. Something was wrong there, which is why a lot of you would say, what does it mean to believe? Almost there. Almost there. Last point, point number three, for the person sitting in the room going, who cares? I got a game to go to. The conscientious person cares. Those who choose not to evaluate their life in light of the words of Jesus and who choose instead to think about things that are temporal in nature, things that are passing away like that, you're playing with fire. And Jesus will warn you, okay, listen carefully. The last part of verse 14 There's a third person in this text. Did you see it? You say, third person? There's only a Pharisee and a tax collector. No, there's a third person. Take a look. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Please remember, he's telling this. This is a historical account of him telling this story to a crowd of people. Hundreds of people heard him say this. Just like a crowd like this. You're hearing his words too, and he's asking you, judge your life by what I'm telling you. He's asking you to make a decision. So, the person who's conscientious, what does that mean? To think carefully about things? What's the opposite of thinking carefully? Thinking carelessly. Choosing instead to fill your mind with all the temporal things. Which one are you? Are you going to take the conscientious route and think about your eternity? Or are you going to take the careless route and think, well, this world is all there is. You've got to make a decision. One thing that you can't read here in this verse, if you're reading it in the English, you know the New Testament is written in Greek, and sometimes there's not an appropriate Greek word to really capture. This is one of those occasions. I think this is going to really shock you, okay? There's two words in here which I need to define for you in the Greek. If you can read it in the Greek, here's what you'd find. The first word, if you have it in your Bible, circle the word humbled. Can you put that next slide up for me, Frank? Frank, there we go. Circle the word humbled. Because this word in the Greek is tapinu, which means to humiliate. Now that changes the context a little bit, doesn't it? It means to bring down low, to humiliate. Think of it like a person who'd go up onto a cross, nearly naked, willingly. Talk about humiliation. Or think about a person who'd wrap nothing but a towel around their waist, almost naked, and wash someone else's feet. For a Jew, that's really humiliating. Why would you go that way? Next word you need to know. Next Greek word is this word exalt. Circle that. This means to lift up for recognition. Exalt. To lift up for recognition. I want you to read this verse again. Now with the definitions extrapolated out like this. Put the next slide up. Take a look. Here's what it says. For everyone who lifts himself up for recognition on that final day will be humiliated but, he, but the one who humiliates himself will be lifted up for recognition by God himself. That's the promise that's repeated over and over and over again in the New Testament. So the person at the end, everybody's going to hold up a box. Okay, God, here's my life inside this box. When I hold this up, if I hold up my own box full of all my good stuff, you're going to be humiliated one day to find out it doesn't make the cut. 
but the one who holds up his box with his head down low and says, I got nothing in here to show of my own. So all I have is the promise of that one who told me that he would credit his perfect life into my bank account. I know the motives of my heart. I present Jesus' life to you. According to the Bible, that one will be lifted up by God and exalted. Doesn't that just do something to your heart? It did to mine when I was studying this week. That's what this means. In our final moments here, I told you I'd talk about what it means to believe. For those of you who are skeptical and say, anybody can just say they believe anything. You're right. The word for believe in the New Testament is very different than our English word believe. When we say we believe, what we say is we acknowledge the facts about something, right? That's not what John 3.16 means. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. It's not a mere acknowledgement of facts. For goodness sakes, what does James say? Even the demons believe the facts about Jesus, right? And they shudder. So what does it mean to believe? Well, I have a little illustration that I think will help you to understand the Greek word for believe so that you'll understand what it means. Imagine that I was to ask Ashley for a folding chair so that I could fix the ceiling fan in our living room. And some of my family's here and they'll go, shouldn't Ashley be the one fixing the ceiling fan? (laughs) And you're right. So let's change this around. Ashley's getting ready to hang a ceiling fan and she asks me for a folding chair because that's more true. And um, I say to her, you sure this is a folding chair? You sure it's going to hold you? And she says, yeah, I believe in the chair. Would any of you who heard Ashley say, I believe in the chair, would you think she meant... I believe it's real. No, that's not what it means to believe. What she means is, I believe that when I step up on it, I have confidence that it'll hold me. That's the New Testament word for believe. Confidence that when you stand on it, it will hold you. Are some light bulbs going off? So when somebody comes to you and says, I believe in Jesus, and then they just go out and live like the rest of the world, like priests who are caught in these acts, that have just been in the news lately, their belief is very different than the New Testament apostles, isn't it? It doesn't seem to line up, does it? Belief changes everything about you if it's a saving belief. It changes how you think, how you act, how you behave, what you love and what you hate. I hate anything that would separate me from the love of God. And so that's what it means to believe. It's not just an acknowledgement of facts. Church, as we close here, you can close your Bibles. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him puts their trust in him like you would stepping on a chair, that his perfect righteousness is the only thing that will get you into heaven. Anybody who believes that will not perish, but will have everlasting life. This is the truth of the gospel. And it separates what we believe from every other religion in the world. According to Jesus, in the creator's courtroom, the self-righteous will be condemned. Those who are trusting in their works will be humiliated one day. Those who are self-condemned and who put their trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ will be lifted up and exalted. And your day is coming. I asked Dave, Dave's going to make his way to the platform, and as he does, I asked him to play my absolute favorite song in closing today. And when he does, I invite you to listen to the words. Because when these words first hit me, they made my heart crumble like a ton of bricks. I want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I come to you as one of these tax collector-like people. I'm a sinner in need of grace. And I need the salvation that's offered through Jesus Christ alone. I put no basis, no merit in my own good works. I pray for those who are here this morning that may have never heard the gospel before. If you're here this morning, this is a small, tiny little church. I can see. Nobody's looking around. If you're here this morning and you would say, yeah, I just I want to put my trust in Jesus. I believe that he died for me. I'm telling you, nobody's looking around. Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to pray for you later today. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. I see several hands all over the room. I'll pray for you today.
Church, we can come to God with great confidence knowing that Christ accomplished our righteousness for us. Thanks be to God who gives us mercy and grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. In His name, all God's people said,